So, on to the next story. This is about four well-known horsemen, all immigrants, I might add, and the principles of riding. I was fortunate enough to begin my formal riding education with Raoul de Leon. Raoul grew up near Havana, Cuba, and learned to ride at the prestigious riding clubs of the day. The instructors were often German ex-cavalry officers who had escaped the ravages and atrocities of World War II. They brought little with them other than their knowledge of riding, the traditions and principles of horsemanship honed over the centuries in the great cavalry schools of Europe. Raul came to the United States to attend college in Texas just before Castro seized power. His family lost most of, most of their wealth and could no longer support Raul's education. So he moved to Long Island and began making a living as a freelance riding instructor. I was one of his earliest pupils. Raul was then, as he is now, dedicated to passing on these principles of riding which he learned basic dressage and gymnastic jumping exercises as the fundamentals of all good riding. These ideas are succinctly outlined in the book Riding Logic, authored by Wilhelm Musler and published first in 1939, three years after the first Billy and Blaze book. Thankfully, it is still widely available today and it remains one of the four cornerstones in my equestrian library. Now, it so happens that at the same time Raoul was beginning his career as a riding instructor, Captain Vladimir Litauer was also teaching riding on Long Island. As many of you know, Mr. Litauer was a Russian cavalry officer who came to the, to the United States after World War I. He's perhaps best known as the father of forward riding, an influential teacher of many pupils, including winners of the Medal McClay finals at the National Horse Show at Madison Square Garden. One of his best students was Bernie Traurig, who preceded me in Pony Club by about 10 years. I'm not sure if this was the approach to riding that he learned in the cavalry or an adaptation based on his personal experience, perhaps a combination of both. Learning of Raoul, this young riding instructor made, making his way in the neighborhood, Mr. Litauer made several attempts to convert Raoul's approach to riding arguing the merits of his philosophy over what we might call the German school. Some have speculated this had its roots in the deep animosity between Russia and Germany. Perhaps. I think there's more to it than that, though. I think it had everything to do with a fundamental understanding of the horse's back and the rider's seat. Litauer wrote a book arguing the point that the horse's back was rigid and that riders should adopt a light forward seat and use it very minimally for, so as to not interfere with the horse's movement. I'll have some thoughts on this a little bit later. Raoul was not persuaded, which considering Raoul's youth and Mr. Litauer's seniority and credentials is really quite remarkable. He was then, as he is now, steadfast in his certainty of the intrinsic and enduring value of the approach to riding which he had been taught, and then spending a lifetime perfecting their execution. In contrast, our current riding culture, what one might call the practical horseman magazine method of learning to ride, has no such bedrock. It's more akin to a five easy steps flavor of the month approach which often leaves riders confused and uncertain. Happily, Raul was bolstered by the newly installed coach of the United States Equestrian Show Jumping Team, Bert Denemethy. Mr. Denemethy, a strong proponent of what we would call the classical school, believed in the influence of the rider's seat in suppling the horse's body and the importance of developing the innate elasticity of the horse's back. And here he stands in contrast to Captain Litauer. He regularly put his riders on the lunge line, riders like Frank and Mary Chapeau, George Morris and Neil Shapiro, who were already international riders in their own right. He wanted them to develop their understanding of a supple and influential seat. And I know this because Raul would take us to Gladstone as young riders to watch Mr. Denemethy's training sessions. 
any young writer could have easily been starstruck by the talents and successes of Mr. Nemesis' writers, but not so for us. Raoul helped us to understand that the masterful execution of the writing principles by Mr. Denemethy himself was the gold standard. On the occasion that we watched him ride, we witnessed a paradigm shift in how horses could mentally and physically be transformed through this approach to riding. I would here strongly recommend Mr. Denemethy's book, The Denemethy Method, not only for its insights, but also for an extraordinary collection of pictures. A few years later, I was invited to Gladstone to train under Jack Legoff, another riding master, this time from the, uh, the French Cavalry School in Saumur, who came to coach the USET three-day event squad. And although I was surrounded by the likes of Mike Plum, Jimmy Wofford, and Michael Page, the undisputed genius in the saddle was Jack Legoff. I have been so fortunate to have witnessed the transformative effect of his riding on so many horses, some of whom we thought were quite ordinary before he showed us otherwise. It is my wish for all riders to witness such fabulous skill. It has inspired my riding ever since. So how then do we come to define truly great riding? How do we recognize it? Is it competitive success, medals won, might I suggest that it's nothing more or less than a manner of riding that ennobles the horse's being. It elevates their physical and mental attributes in a respectful manner. It is not specific to the achievement of a certain standard or level, nor is it tied to competitive success. This is a little box in the book Riding Logic, which I love. He refused to put a picture of a, of a horse in what he calls a state of being on the aids, and he stresses the idea of harmony between horse and rider, which I think is great. The pathway to the ennoblement of the horse has been well established by riding masters across time. We need to be reminded of them often, but trust me, they do not need to be reinvented. Our success is ultimately adjudicated by the horse. The results are consistently true, authentic, good, and beautiful. So here we might ask, why is really good riding so rarefied? Or better yet, so difficult? Perhaps more bluntly put by some, why in the name of good riding do many horses and riders look so miserable? Are there obstructions to success that could be and should be removed. For the past 30 years, I've been considering the role the saddle plays in all of this, what it does, does not, or could do to help in the furtherance of great riding and in the ennoblement of the horse's being. 